You are listening to the Tuesday weekly edition of the Air Hug Community Podcast. This is episode 116. Hey, welcome everybody. If you are new here, this is, and if you're not new here, welcome back. But if you're new here, I just want to give you the 411 on this podcast. This is the Air Hug Community Podcast, and you can also think of it as um, a midlife mojo discussion board. So in this podcast, we come together to talk about midlife. We talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, all the emotions. We talk about approaches for living better. We talk about all sorts of things. We bring in guests. And this is just something that was created as a need out of my business from Grateful Fitness of working with women. I wanted to have a place where we could come to talk about things further. And so this is the place. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Let's get after it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Air Hug Community Podcast. And today I have a topic that has just really been very, very interesting. And, you know, people like to say that men and women are different, and they are different in very many ways. Okay. (laughs) I know I didn't have to say that, but I just wanted to point that out going into what I'm about to say next. The question that has always been asked, are men's brains and women's brains different? And according to a meta-analysis, which is a study that reviews a lot of studies, and this was just published in um, July of 2021, there's actually no such thing as a female and male brain, even though we would like to think there is, right? So end of story. No, actually, this is just the beginning of the story. So let's cue up Dr. Lisa Mosconi. She is a PhD associate professor of neuroscience at the Wheel Cornell Medicine School. And she's also the um, launcher, director, creator of the Women's Brain Initiative. So And she actually created the Women's Brains Initiative to ask some very important questions because it's it's statistically, these are the facts. Women are more likely than men to be diagnosed with anxiety, depression, headaches, and migraines. And of the 60 million people in the United States of America that have dementia, two-thirds of them are women. And we know that two-thirds of the population is not female. So Dr. Moscone has really been focused on trying to figure out why this is so. So what she has learned is that although the brains are not different of men and women, they actually age differently. And a huge factor in how, in the difference here, is menopause. So Women age differently than men in a nutshell, but we're going to open up this nutshell in a minute, but they age differently than men. We age differently than men because of our hormones, all right? I know, it sucks, right? Everything, I feel like we could blame everything on hormones. Um, Turns out a lot of things have to do with our hormones. But the fact of the matter is, this I found very interesting, is that our brains and our ovaries talk to each other every single day, all right? And the brain-ovary communication is actually part of the neuroendocrine system, all right? And the health of our ovaries is linked to the health of our brain. So hormones like estrogen, all right, and other hormones involved in reproduction like progesterone are a big factor here. But also brain function is key for energy production in the brain. And the estrogen, specifically estradiol, is a key part of brain energy. So having estrogen is a big part of it. So it's interesting because this estrogen pushes neurons to bring glucose to the brain to make energy. So if 
estrogen is high, then brain energy is high. If estrogen is low, then brain energy, actually the neurons age faster if estrogen is low. So this process alone can lead to the, lead to the formation. formation. <laughs> this process of low est having low estrogen can actual, actually lead to formation of amyloid plaques. And amyloid plaques are a harm. Oh, oh my gosh, I must need more coffee today. I must not be getting energy to my brain. <laughs> but the formation of amyloid plaques is a hallmark sign of Alzheimer's disease. So not everyone with these plaques gets Alzheimer's disease, but it is a sign of Alzheimer's disease. And the effect is strong in certain areas. So in the hypothalamus, which regulates body temperature, when estrogen is not available in the hypothalamus to help with energy, then the hypothalamus cannot regulate body temperature. Cue up hot flashes. Okay? In the brain stem, which controls our sleep and wake cycles, cycles, when estrogen is not available to help with energy, we don't sleep. We lose our regulation of sleep and wake cycles. In the amygdala, when estrogen is not available to help with energy, we get things like mood swings and we get forgetful. So isn't that interesting, right? And the thing is, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. This doesn't show up in men. It shows up in women who have already gone through the hormone decline, a.k.a. the menopause process. So brains show a 30% drop in brain energy levels in women. So they, what she did in the um, Women's Brain Initiative... They studied women before menopause, during menopause, and after, and they also studied men. And what they found that women from the be before menopause to after experienced a 30% drop in brain energy levels. Men experienced no change in energy levels. All right. The brain energy decline does correlate with menopause, but not age. So it doesn't matter the age. What matters is the onset of menopause. And you know that people begin menopause at a variety of different ages. You know, there's a, an average age, but it's really, it can vary, you know, by as much as 10 years or maybe even more. But females are much more sensitive to hormonal aging than chronological aging. Do you get me on this? So your brain can age from hormonal changes and we're much more sensitive to that than to the, our actual years on this earth. So many of us women can feel these changes, right? This is what hormonal changes do to our brains. So the fact of the matter is we are not crazy, right? And headaches are not all in our head. Well, they are in our head, but the pain is real is what I'm trying to say. So our brain clearly goes through a transition when we go through menopause and we do need to support and adjust. So what about cognitive performance? This is interesting. Um, and there is no difference actually in cognitive performance. So we don't get dumber. We just have less energy, right? We can't sleep. We get hot and we're moody. So <laughs> sounds great. Doesn't it? Can hardly wait. Actually, I'm already there. But anyways, so the thing is, we're tired, but we're just as sharp as we, have, as we have ever been. So even if we have brain fog, it doesn't mean that our cognitive performance suffers. So on a more serious note, right, the scan for amyloid plaques showed a significant increase in amyloid plaques. Remember, those are the little plaques that happen in our brain. They actually significantly increase during menopause transition. Now, let's make sure you understand this. Not all women develop plaques, and not all women with plaques develop dementia. That's really important to note because we don't want to make that assumption. So plaques are a risk factor for dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but they are not a diagnosis. So I just want to make sure that we all understand that, okay? So, but in menopause, you know, 
these things can happen. All right. So the thing is, if Alzheimer's is going to happen and we, you know, we do have, if someone does have plaques and they are the kind of person who's going to get dementia from them, these changes actually happen in midlife. And oftentimes people think of dementia as a disease of old age, but it's actually a disease that begins in middle age, but doesn't show up until older age. So that's, it's, it's, that's an important thing to know. So Alzheimer's and dementia actually begin, I'm going to say it again, they begin in midlife and silently in women when it happens due to menopause or hormonal changes. So yikes, right? Now, what about women in their 50s or earlier who have surgical removal of their uterus and ovaries, right? They have um, a medical menopause, right? Medically induced menopause. That does correlate with a higher risk for dementia. Not saying they're going to get it, but they're at a higher risk. So we're not suggesting a decline of these procedures if needed, right? According to Dr. Moscone, because if someone needs that procedure, they need it, but they just need to get clear on what happens to our brains when, when that happens. And it doesn't matter if it's natural or medical induced, there are risks associated, right? So the thing is what Dr. Moscone was saying, she doesn't really suggest hormone replacement therapy as a treatment for prevention of Alzheimer's. No, that's not what she's saying. Because right now there are no studies to suggest that. So hormone therapy, you know, right now people do say it helps with hot flashes and other things, but it is not, I just want to make this clear, not recommended for the prevention of dementia. Okay, so don't run to your GYN and ask for a prescription as a prevention for dementia. So, but how can we protect our brain? Well, this is where it gets fun because there are other ways to support our home hormones in their non-medical ways. But it does require looking at our lifestyle differently. And this is where I get really excited because there are things that we can do with our lifestyle to actually help with some of these phytoestrogens or plant estrogens, have them present in our body. So we can change the way we eat, exercise, sleep, and the stress in our lives. So all of these things can impact our hormones for better or for worse. Food, exercise, sleep, and stress. So let's talk about food. There is one diet, and you know I'm not a big advocate of pushing diets on people, but if there is one diet that's actually going to help in this situation, it is the Mediterranean diet. And the yes, question is why? And it is because it does r lower the risk, studies show, for cognitive decline. All right? So it lowers the risk for, and this is pretty well known, you know, that the Mediterranean diet is recommended for lowering your risk for depression, stroke, heart disease, cancer. Okay? And it's, it even helps with hot flashes, having fewer hot flashes. And the reason is because this type of diet is actually rich in food, foods that contain phytoestrogens. So these are plant estrogens. Now, some phytoestrogens are associated. I just want to like, ding, ding, ding. Here's an exception. There are some phytoestrogens that are associated with a higher risk for cancer, but these are not the ones in the Mediterranean diet. So yay. All right. But here are some that are part of the Mediterranean diet that can actually help. Flax seed, Dried apricots, I'm so excited, I'm actually going to go out and buy some this weekend. Sesame seeds, chickpeas, and other legumes. Whole grains, fruits, and yes, are you ready folks? Dark chocolate. And we talked about that a few episodes back. And the key word here is dark. So not your milk chocolate that's like 80% sugar, right? You want something that, and I forget the percentage, like 70% or more of chocolate. Okay, so another action that we can do with our lifestyle is to avoid things that suppress our estrogens. So what are things, because remember, we're already going to have less estrogen available, right? But one thing that you can do that actually helps to suppress estrogens 
is stress. So stress is an estrogen suppressor. So basically stress can steal your estrogen, if you want to think of it that way, all right? And that's because of another hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is the stress hor hormone, right? So cortisol works in balance with estrogen. If cortisol increases, then estrogen decreases. And the reverse happens too. So what we want to do is reduce our stress because reducing stress reduces cortisol, which leaves more estrogen available. This is very, very important. Now, maybe we can't reduce all the stress in our life, but we can reduce how we react to it. And that's a very important thing. Um, practice to work on. So remember, it not only improves your day, it improves your brain. So stress reduction is really important to our health, again, and not just our whole outlook. So changing how we understand the female brain changes the way we care for it. And that's what I love about listening to Dr. Moscone. So she has a book called The XX Brain. She's done a TED Talk. She's been interviewed in all sorts of places. Um, and I actually looked at all these things when I was gathering up all her in information. And it, I just thought it was really, really interesting. Uh, do I have anything else to add to this? Hormone fluctuations. I just want to reiterate the point that it's not that they begin at a certain age. They begin they, when they begin. And just to go over, in case anyone, you probably all know this, but it's worth saying again, the time when you diagnose menopause is when it's already happened. When you've gone 12 months without a period, you've already been in menopause, but that is the definitive diagnosis. And so one other thing that they found, eek, I don't like that, is that women actually experienced a loss of gray matter at this time. And those are the cells that actually process information. They also experienced a loss, and this is what they found through brain scans, again with Dr. Moscone, was that is also a loss of white matter, and those are the fiber that connect these cells. So in post-menopause, here's something exciting. Those losses stop, and we actually can repair or get the levels can increase again, but it never goes back to the original. So we never get back to where we were pre-menopause. But it does, the findings suggest that our brains go through this process and then recoups a little bit, but not back to where we started. But it also suggests that our brain adapts to the new normal. And I'm just cracking up the new normal, like as if we haven't gone through enough new normal, right, with COVID. Now in midlife, we found out that we go through this whole adaption and we have a whole other new normal between our ears. So ha ha ha, what can I say? Um, <laughs> so that's it. And I just, you know, I want to just reiterate really quickly again, that hormone therapy is not really ever indicated for, it's not without risk and it's not indicated in prevention of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And so if you have any questions about that, you know, things that hormone therapy treats are things like hot flashes and bone loss and urinary leaks and vaginal changes, you know, but the best thing you can do is talk to your doctor about what's right for you. So this was just, I thought this was really important because I think a lot of times people poo-poo our brains and our brains do, maybe they start out the same, but because of the changes in our hormones, they do end up different. And so, you know, menopause is all in your head. Not really, it's in your ovaries too. But just remember, your ovaries and your brain talk. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. I find it very fascinating and I just think, you know what, we cannot be too informed and, you know, talk to your doctor if you have questions about your own particular situation. And that's it for this week. We will be back next week on the Air Hug Community podcast. You can find Dr. Moscone, Lisa Moscone is her name, and if you want to look up her TED Talk, it gives kind of a really nice summary of this whole thing on the um, TED Women's Collective. So that's it for today. Bye. Bye.